One of my greatest hopes in writing the book, Timothy Keller, His Spiritual and Intellectual Formation, is to add to our understanding of evangelical history in the second half of the 20th century into the early 21st century. Keller's life spans and intersects with many of the most significant people, events, and trends within Christianity during the last 75 years. The same can be said of John Piper, who along with Keller is a founding council member of the Gospel Coalition. Piper is nearly five years older than Keller. Between them, they've studied in many of the most influential institutions of the post-war new evangelicalism, such as Wheaton College, Fuller Theological Seminary, and Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. They themselves have built several of the most inf influential institutions of the new Calvinism, such as Bethlehem College and Seminary, Desiring God, and the Gospel Coalition, not to mention their significant work, notably as pastors. They share something else significant in common. Both list Jonathan Edwards and C.S. Lewis among their top influences. And in this special season of Gospel Bound, we're exploring in depth several key influences that appear in my book on Tim Keller. So I'm excited to talk with John Piper now about Edwards and Lewis. But I'm eager to learn about evangelical feminism and the reception to Piper's own expansive writing and teaching. John, thank you for joining me again on Gospel Bound. That sounds intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can handle it. Goes here. I think you can handle it. Let's start off with an easy one. Do you remember what it was like to read C.S. Lewis for the first time? No, but I know when it happened. But my memory is not good enough to know what it was quite like. It was it, my freshman year in college. I had never heard of C.S. Lewis, believe it or not. I mean, I didn't. Most everybody I I talked to says, "Oh, I read the children's books when I was little." Well, I never heard of them <laughs> until I was eighteen, and that was at Wheaton College. And at Wheaton College, he was a staple because. The incarnation of, of C.S. Lewis worked there, right? Clyde Kilby was the American uh, instantiation of C.S. Lewis, and he was my teacher. I was a lit major, and and so, um, but that wasn't the first. His class was where I saw Lewis in action, kind of, but uh, it was in a Bible class my freshman year where we were assigned mere Christianity, and uh, all I recall is that when I was done, I wanted more but that's pretty pretty vague. <laughs> I think the general way to say it from the Wheaton experience was um, Lewis was was part of my simply coming awake to the life of the mind. Uh, that's what Wheaton was for me. My, my theology wasn't formed at Wheaton. It was formed later. Uh, but my mind was awakened to to see, to think, to try to be rational, to be thoughtful, to be careful, to be precise, those kinds of things were coming alive, and Lewis was just a huge part of that. Well, I think, John, that many younger listeners would exactly be surprised that there was a time when actually neither Edwards nor Lewis was widely read among American evangelicals. You were 17 when Lewis died. How would you explain or describe the growth in popularity for Lewis that really does not show any signs of, of slowing, which, I mean, it's remarkable for a historical figure that, again, it seems to only be increasing in interest and also at the same time relevance. Yeah. Well, not having done any um, sociological exploration to find out why it's happening. <laughs> I'll speak out of my own experience because yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess it's typical. Yeah. Namely, I find in C.S. Lewis, I have I have always found in C.S. Lewis a unique combination that's just not found anywhere else. I, I don't know anybody else that I've read or met who combines um, a, a poetic eye for the world, a love of great literature, a powerful imagination, that's all on one side, with what I would call just razor-sharp logic on the other side mm. that prevents him from being snickered, snookered, is that the right word, snookered <laughs> by any modern yeah. silliness. I mean, he just sees right through things. And so those two things together, in fact, the uh, the little paperback that I remember, and I don't even remember who wrote it, 
the title captured me, romantic rationalist. Mm. That was it. I mean, that's what I wanted to be. That's what I felt was inside of me. And that's why I think he's he's unique. He He's a, a, a radically careful thinker, and he's got this wonderfully enticing imagination. And by that, I, I don't just mean that he can think up interesting stories like the Narnia books or the Space Trilogy. I mean that he, when he writes, is concrete and feelable, tasteable, touchable. <laughs> That's what makes a good writer, right? He's When he writes, you feel like you're, you're in touch with reality. And so um, those two things together, those two spheres of of intellectual and imaginary life, I think he embodies. Now, I'm just kind of assuming he's a Christian, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but but you add Christianity on that. I mean, yeah. really orthodox, historic Christianity, unapologetically so. Yeah. And that's a very, very rare combination. I have a feeling then that you're previewing how you would respond to the same questions about Edwards. Um, do you remember what it was like reading Edwards for the first time? Yes, more so than, than Lewis, because it came later, and it was much more self-conscious in in my pursuits. Um, <clears throat> I think probably like everybody else, I didn't know anything about Edwards until I was 22, except Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I, and, and I assume that was probably a pretty good sermon. I don't know that I'd ever read it, but I'd heard about it. But when I got to Fuller and was thrown into the hermeneutics class with Dan Fuller, I was introduced to Edwards. And and the first thing I remember is this. I'm sitting in a class with about 80 students, and probably a third of those students were students from the School of Psychology, which Mm. had just been founded. Mm. These students were not regularly sympathetic with Dan Fuller. Uh, Fuller was a little bit of a bumbler. Uh, He was my favorite teacher. I loved him to death. He's still alive, believe it or not. He's 96 years old uh, out in California. I've been in touch with him a few times recently. And and if I can help him to hear me, he remembers me, believe it or not. (laughs) So I'm just I'm just thrilled because I love the man to death. And he was what what Kilby was for Lewis, uh, Fuller was for Edwards, for me. He he was the the embodiment. And what he did was one day in class, a, a uh, what do you call him? A psych student raised their hand and said, "Why do we have to be so rational in this class? Don't you know that people don't get moved by reason?" Dan Fuller, Doctor Fuller, and and he was quite upset. And I'm sitting there loving this man and ticked off at that (laughs) attitude. And Fuller answers like this. He says, well, I don't see why we can't be like Jonathan Edwards, Hmm. who would be writing a philosophical treatise that would bend the minds of the great philosophers and then break into a paragraph that would warm your grandmother's heart. That's the way he said it. Hmm. Everything in me said, Okay, if there's another one of those on the planet, I want I want to know who that is. I was off to the library, and I think the first book I found there was the end for which God created the world. Actually, it was a little paper uh, it was stapled together, and in the bookstore for eighty five cents, I think. And I went and got that and and read it. So it was the combination of religious affections, which is the name of one of his main right. books. And uh, a profoundly rational approach to uh, religion. He he believed things ought to be reasonable, and he believed that if it doesn't move your heart, you're not saved. Now you you've often relayed Dan Fuller's advice to pick one theologian to study your whole life. Maybe you've already answered this, but how did you pick Edwards? Probably the influence, um, not just that he had on me, but hearing from others uh, that here was a man who was probably America's greatest theologian. Um, 
biographers said that sort of thing in those days. Um, and I, I, I just couldn't believe that. I mean, he was just a New England pastor, as far as I knew. And they're talking like he's in touch with European currents of thought and he's engaging with high level philosophy and he's got a mind that excels all other minds and <laughs> I, I just say well there must be something there and the more i tasted what he wrote the more profoundly it shaped me i mean I, lewis can't hold a can a candle to the impact edwards had on me theologically yeah lewis had impacts on me um linguistically intellectually poetically but edwards showed me god and that was uh, more important to me than anything else and the more i looked the more i saw and the more i loved and and the more i wanted and so it wasn't hard to say i'll probably be with this man the rest of my life and and more or less if you were to look at my ipad i have logos on my ipad i have all the works of edwards all the yale uh, books on on my ipad i know that the volumes of the sermons and discourses are all there and i have them all ready to just ping at any moment when i have a, an uncertainty of, well what should i read tonight or i'm on an airplane and i'm tired i need a little bit of uh taste of god under my tongue where can I go? And I'll I'll go to an, a sermon by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, John, I often think of George Marsden's biography in 2004 as maybe the peak of the most recent interest in Edwards. Who was writing those biographies back then that were showing you that you should be looking into Edwards more? Was that that was that Perry Miller? Uh, others from that period? I, you know, I never read Perry Miller, but Perry Miller is the one who said he was the greatest theologian, I'm... and he's quoted all the time. Uh, I didn't read it because I heard he was an atheist. I said, right. what, what, what is that? Right. <laughs> what are you going to show me about Edwards? But Winslow, okay. um, Ola Winslow, I remember that name. I read three biographies of Edwards while I was in Germany. Hmm. That's okay. the only one I can remember right now. Okay. Um, sorry. I, my, my well, mind I, well the reason me. I'm asking is because what I've often found working on this book is that so much of the things that I've lived through or that I've even written about or documented under your leadership or others, they ha they've happened earlier at different periods of time in, in blessed ways. And so I just wasn't familiar with a lot of that interest in Edwards until really your popularization happened to coincide with the publishing of the Yale works. Yeah. Um, and so I just wasn't familiar with that earlier, earlier period. Now, I'd like to know a little bit more about about Edwards on the nature of true virtue. Uh, from what I can see in Tim Keller, that's the most influential work of Edwards for him. You ranked it number four on Edwards' writings for you. Just help us to understand what makes this work so edifying. Well, edifying is not what I'd call it. Okay. Um, who, somebody described it as uh, the most quintessentially logical book ever written or something like mm. that. I mean, it, it is rarefied. It is not a book I would go to for an airplane ride needing a taste of God under my tongue. Yeah. Um, I mean, he. what in the world would it mean to say um, in that book that benevolence towards being is the nature of true virtue? <laughs> what in the world does that mean? Um, um, what that? I remember reading that book on a on a white swing in the in the um, outdoor patio in Barnesville, Georgia, the summer before I left to go to Germany. Hmm. And here's my here's what I remember it's having an effect on me. That was the first time I'd heard anybody unfold with care the distinction between the love of benevolence and the love of complacency. Hmm. Complacency meaning you find it lovely. You love what is lovely. Benevolence, you may, you may love what is quite unlovely, but you have a good will toward it. Hmm. And that difference made a huge difference for me. It helped me sort out lots of love language in, in the Bible and how to talk about love carefully, 
So that was one thing. Um, there was another thing in there where he said, and I'd never heard anybody else say this until then, though I'm sure they have, that justice will be done in the universe. Every single wrong will be punished, either in hell or on the cross. Right. I mean, what that did for me by way of saying justice reigns in this world, the nature of true virtue as God being benevolent toward being and yet being a God of infinite justice who will set right everything he has unjustly forgiven. That's the danger of Romans 3.25. He put Christ forward to make yeah. him look righteous because he had passed over former sins, which made him look unrighteous. Mm -hmm. And now you've got God being just in hell, God being just on the cross, so n nobody's sin goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the takeaways from, from the tr nature of true virtue. Which I mean, is... I read, you have to understand, I'm what are the differences between me and Keller, I think? I don't know if you're even going to ask this, but yeah. he's a philosopher. He's really got a brain that I don't have. <laughs> he really can think at a level of philosophical um, complexity and cultural um, understanding that poor little John Piper <laughs> cannot do. So when I'm reading a, a book of Edwards who's got that same kind of mind, I'm just picking it. I'm looking for little things that will help me. <laughs> I just want to live, right? I just want to be a good husband, be a good, be a good pastor, and 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 put as many pieces together as I can. So I'm sure I missed a lot in in the nature of true virtue. Well, the the reason the reason I'm I'm asking is Edwards. Of course, there's so much that so many of us can get from him from the same treatise, and you might grab one thing, and Tim yep. might over, grab something else over here. Tim's main observation, he would go back to Edwards a lot, and he'd go back to Nature of True Virtue a lot. But mainly what he would do is go back to the basic idea that there are many things that we can love, but which cost somebody else a problem. But only through the Nature of True Virtue can we love things only for their own sake, essentially, mm -hmm. and for, you know, without, any, without any loss or any complication there. It was just it was kind of a basic concept that he came back to repeatedly and part of what i'm what i'm wondering about here is that you know you had the you had the advice to pick one theologian keller's practice would suggest learning at least something from everyone now i think your advice is probably more practical for most of us <laughs> to your earlier well learning point something there. from everyone that's not a problem <laughs> learning learning enough from everyone to be their conversation partner that's a problem <laughs> yeah well I was, it, it is it's to your point it's hard to sound coherent when you have so many different influences maybe that is tim's unique gifting would you caution pastors and other church elders against reading too widely well in general, yes, but the re the way I'd put it is, I would caution everybody against reading superficially. Yeah, and most of us read slow enough that that equates with reading widely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For, seriously, you if, yeah. if if you go on the internet or or just look at any magazine, World Magazine, Christianity Day Magazine, Christian Century Magazine, Charisma Magazine, whatever magazine you want, you're going to see twenty books you haven't read. Right. You're going to feel behind the times. You're going to feel like you can't be a, a good conversation partner for the latest pastor's gathering. And you're going to be intimidated and you're going to go out and do some skimming and you're going to become a pedant. You're not going to think deeply and you're not going to have a firm grasp on what you ought to know. So, yeah, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm speaking defensively here because I'm a slow reader, right? I have to justify my way. <laughs> And yet, uh, there may be enough truth in what I'm saying to caution some pastors that if you be, if you become the way Dr. Fuller used to put it is, um, I have taught you guys how to read. Now, you can become the peer of anybody that you take the time to master. You don't need me anymore. You can read the Institutes carefully enough to become a 
peer with John Calvin, not not equal in intellect, but knowing his ways of thinking enough, you can actually interact with him responsibly. You can't do that with 10 people unless you're a rarefied genius. And I think we need to do it. We, we need to know uh, a few people well, especially our Bibles. Yeah, yeah, above all. Above all. And, and I think that's a huge... I think maybe sometimes unspoken benefit to the work that you and Tim have done your whole lives is you're immersed in the Bible because you're preaching it every week, um, not just in the devotional life, but also in that in that study. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. You know, you both of you left the academy to become pastors. Didn't have to do that, but both chose to do that. Um, let me, I didn't explain very well. Um, I'm going to go back over the part just for the listeners um, of Tim's, kind of when he takes away from the nature of true virtue. It's the distinction between common and true virtue. Common virtues, love for family, nation, and self, they breed rivalry because we put our families ahead of others, pit nations against others, choose our self-interest over others. But the kind of true virtue we see in revived Christians when God becomes their ultimate good, it blesses everyone in there. So the highest love for God that blesses others instead of making us choose between one or the other. Um, now I'm going to, let's dive into some evangelical feminism here. Cause I know this is a part of history that a lot of people don't know and that you have a lot of experience with. Um, and I think even you, as you and I talked about this would, were surprised by some of the overlaps that you have here with Tim and his wife, Kathy. Um, you know, Tim and Kathy, of course, studied together at Gordon Conwell, 72 to 75, and they encountered the beginning at that time of evangelical feminism. And one of the things I talk about in the book is Tim starting the magazine with some of his friends' table talk so that he could uh, lock horns and criticize two of, his, two of his professors for being heretical, two of whom later moved to your alma mater, Fuller, or one of whom, at least. I don't, can't remember if both did. And one of them taught about feminism in the most popular course at Fuller. Again, this is after your time. Um, now, the Kellers grew close not only with R.C. Sproul, but also their professor, Elizabeth Elliot. A lot of people will not remember that connection between them. And we know how she shaped what would later be called the complementarian roles of men and women in the church and home. I'm just wondering, John, if you could take us back to those early 1970s and the emergence of these debates over the role of men and women among evangelicals. Here's a little irony of history. My most influential professor and dearly beloved professor, Dan Fuller, is an egalitarian through and through. Yeah. Uh, so was his, his wife, was his wife. Um, so it's not as though I was indoctrinated at Fuller right. Seminary. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> in complementarianism didn't exist yeah. in those days. Um, but um, my my first serious dealing with it, I think, was the publication of Paul Jewett's Man is Male and Female. And I was in Germany when that was published, and I read it as one of my professors that I admired and appreciated. And he said flat out that, First Timothy 2.13 was a misstep for Paul, a mistake. He just flat out called this verse about, I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over man because Adam was created first and the man was not deceived, but the woman. That a leftover from his rabbinic heritage and he shouldn't have said it. And I thought, well, he's just lost his job, hmm. and he didn't. And that was, for me, the beginning of the end. Now, I'm sure it was not the beginning, um, but it was, for me, the beginning of the end of, of Fuller's uh, faithfulness. And he he went on to, to write The Ordination of Women, and then I got a job at Bethel College, in those days, now called Bethel University, and the debates that went on there with Virginia Mollencott coming right. in, for example, who called me obscene mm. 
for my view. And Wayne Gruden was there for, we overlapped for a couple of years, and Wayne and I would mm. talk, and there emerged in our minds the need for um, pretty articulate responses to the kinds of things that were being being said. Yeah, well, I think it was, um, so Jewett was again at Full Earth till when, do you have to recall? I don't recall. Okay. Yeah, so Scholler, David Scholler, New Testament professor, went from Gordon Conwell to Fuller, taught on evangelical feminism, and he was the one one of them that they got into the arguments with at the time. Yeah. I think a lot of people just don't they don't remember why something like CBMW was produced. Or I know you've talked to me a number of times in the past about people just not recalling what that period was was like yeah. not recognizing the, that there was not an advocacy for complementarianism despite it being the historic biblical view right that it, it, it was so assumed that you didn't feel like you needed exegetical arguments or uh, conferences or institutions to mount their forces to defend it but uh, toward the end of the 80s the ETS uh, stacked the deck at one particular meeting and had about five presenters from an egalitarian viewpoint. And I think Wayne Grudem was the only alternative. And that pushed Wayne over the edge to say we need to do something a little more concerted. And and so the CBMW, through several years, came into being that way. Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, yeah. which I was part of its beginning. Right. Well, I don't know how many people associate Tim and Kathy with those movements, but it is a huge aspect of their lives, not only because of Kathy making the decision not to pursue ordination, which she had thought that she would do early on, but because of their connection to Elizabeth Elliot. Um, and it's interesting the way different people's history will affect their experience and their articulation, because what seemed to work for them with Elizabeth Elliot was ultimately the the radical submission to Scripture. What Scripture says goes. God gets to correct us. We don't get to correct God. And what was interesting, when I went back through the Gordon Conwell student newspapers, I think you'll be interested in this. One of them was, Scholler was arguing that um, opposing women's ordination was the same as segregation, opposing racial integration. It was the same thing. So it was early 1970s. Then they talked to one of the students. She had recently graduated and was serving as a pastor. And they and it was a it was kind of an aggressive interview. <laughs> the student said, "How do you reconcile your views with Paul?" And she said, "I'm not aware that I'm supposed to reconcile any of my views with Paul." So there were those same schools of thought of Paul was just wrong, or Scholler's view was more of the accommodationist. Yes, the Bible is wrong in places because it was written by humans, though it is still divinely inspired, and we need to pursue the uh, hermeneutic of liberation, essentially, mm -hmm. in there. I, I, just, I don't know how many people recall that was all there in the 1970s. Yeah, the, the, way, the way it was put to me uh, from Paul Jewett was, you're fighting a, a backwater movement, yeah. Today, they'd say you're on the wrong side of history, right. and you will wake up someday, or your sons and grandsons will, and say your position is as unthinkable as the support for slavery. Yeah. That, that's, that, was, that was the argument. Which, of course, we see that being extended to homosexuality in our own day, and who knows, yeah. who knows what else. Um, I want to ask about something you know you and you and tim both you tend to produce a diverse and even eclectic set of followers and i might even say that that's similar to edwards and lewis of what we've been talking about here now someone might really like one aspect of your writing but not another they might want one of your titles but not another one sermon but not another how do you feel about that is that okay or or do you think look this is all connected in a way that never can be or should be separated from each other um well i could i i could look at it by saying i'm thrilled that anybody's affected by anything i write <laughs> or i could look at it and say 
I wish everybody who was thrilled was thrilled with everything. I, write. <laughs> <laughs> I, I choose the former because I think the latter is ridiculously unrealistic for right. any human being. Right. Um, so, you know, um, I think early on, God made it clear to me, you are not going to be a um, macro organizer unifier a la Harold John Ockengay type. Yeah, right. You're not going to be a, um, a guy who's just kind of pulling together all kinds of things. Here's a little anecdote to illustrate that. Yeah. C.J. Mahaney and I were having um, lunch one time at Applebee's way, way back. And I had just come back from Mars Hill, right, mm -hmm. where I had done a seminar for Mark Driscoll, trying my best to to make him palatable. And um, I said to CJ, have you ever heard of Mark Driscoll? And, and Mars Hill said, no. Well, he'd never heard of you either. <laughs> so here's, here's a charismatic church planting reform movement on the East Coast. Right. And a charismatically open church planting reform movement on the West Coast. You guys never heard of each other. Do you think, CJ, that I should try to to manage those streams into a river? He said, Oh, absolutely. And I thought, I don't I don't think I'm I'm called to do that at all. If if that's gonna happen, somebody else is gonna do it. So my mindset has always been I drop my pebble in the in the in the water. And if if God wants to blow on the ripples and make something big happen, he will. But all, all I'm called to do is say what I see in the Bible and let the chips fall where they will. And my guess is that um, enables people to pick and choose what parts of what I write they, they like. Yeah, and Akengay was your president at Fuller, right? He was the president before I got oh, there. Oh, before David, you got David there. David Hubbard was the president. Okay, so you were right he was after part that. part of the founding, yeah. You're, for, you're right after that transition, okay, because then, of course, he did go to Gordon-Conwell and was the president yeah, when yeah. Tim and Kathy and was there. Gay was the instrument God used to call me out of pre-med into yeah. ministerial pursuits. Yeah, but it's, a, it's amazing. The Now, during that time period, their late 60s, 1970s, I'm just kind of going off the cuff here, were you influenced by other British evangelicals beyond yeah. uh, beyond Lewis? Yeah, I can remember sitting or, in my senior dormitory room, which was a single room with the little yellow copy of Men Made New by John Stott <laughs> on Romans five, seven, five, six, seven, and eight, and I was absolutely blown away by it. Yeah. Um, I had heard him speak at Urbana sixty seven. Okay. And he did, I think he did First Timothy, expository messages in the morning, and I was riveted. And so I wanted to know more about this guy. And I read that, you know, he apologized later for that book by saying it didn't have enough windows, meaning illustrations. And I just shook my head and said, don't add any windows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this house is so full of treasures. Why would you want to open any windows? But um, so Stott, Stott was significant. Uh, Packer was just coming into his own. I think he visited. He, he came to uh, Wheaton once. And I remember he was asked. It's funny what you remember. He was asked in a, in a big forum do you think there's any command to to pray for people to be saved? Now that just I mean this person must have been out of touch because I would have gone immediately to Romans 10 pr Paul yeah. prays for his kinsmen that yeah. they would be saved but but Packer paused in his slow way and he said our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Hmm. This is what he said. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I got to study the Lord's Prayer some more because <laughs> that that really is a prayer that His name would be hallowed mm. in people's hearts. And so, anyway, Jab Hacker was another one. Um, Lloyd Jones. When did Lloyd Jones come in? Lloyd Jones came in when um, George Verwer stood up at Urbana '67, okay. okay. held up the two volumes 
of the Sermon on the Mount mm. and in his inimitable way said, these are the most important books that have ever been written in the 20th century. <laughs> I said, okay. So in the summer of 68, between my graduation from college and, and seminary, I read I read those whole two volumes while I was working as a surveyor in Wheaton, mm. waiting to go off to seminary and remember feeling, wow. If if I could handle the scriptures like that and see what he sees, so that that was another he was another big influence. Yeah, yeah. From from Tim's experience, the kind of American evangelical movement had not really come into its intellectual own when he was in seminary. I think in part it was there had been so many of those battles, battles for the Bible was that era, of course, in which Fuller was was so prominent. And of course, the earlier fundamentalist model, modernist debates. And so there was a sense in which the British evangelicals were providing a lot of that ballast at the time yeah. of, of, of bringing together this, um, this gospel spirit with this intellectual heft um, that just was not, not available, broadly speaking, compared to our day. Yeah, um, yeah. at least, and something to give thanks for. Yeah, here's an anecdote to, to yeah. show that that what was happening there. I mean, Fuller thought of itself as the birth of the rectification of that problem right. of, of, a, of, of a fundamentalism that had a, a hostile attitude towards culture rather than engaging one, and that lacked the intellectual firepower to do the serious academic work, and they were going to fix that. And so George Ladd said to me one time, he said, when I came here, all they did was find a pastor in New England because they desperately needed somebody who had a doctorate, <laughs> and I had one from Harvard. Today, now this is this is now when I'm I'm there, and so he he's been there for what twenty years or so. I'm I'm not sure how long it was. He said, today we scoured the world to find the best scholar, and they they called Ralph Martin from England. Mm. Well, that did not go over well with me. That mm. did not sit well with me. I remember hearing him say that, saying, I think I think something's out of whack here because I didn't hear anything say about orthodoxy or prayer mm. or devotion or love for Jesus, just front rank scholar. And, you know, Lad, Lad could be on cloud nine or devastated. When when his book was reviewed negatively, yeah. his... his um, Kingdom of God book, it devastated him. Absolutely. Probably turned him to alcohol. And when his New Testament theology sold like crazy through mm. Erdman's, he walked down the hall waving a $9,000 royalty check oh, saying, it, it's selling, it's selling. I mean, his, my, my I, I don't know, I may be kidding myself, um, Colin, but I've written a lot of books. And frankly, if they didn't sell anything, I don't think my ego or my my reason for being would stop. I mean, I love my church. I love my family. I love what I'm doing now, because to me, to see the glory and to say the glory is wonderful. And if if it sells a lot of books, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's God's business. <laughs> I think that's actually the only way you can write as much as you do, <laughs> because uh, it's just yeah. the, the level that's of right. work that's required. <laughs> To do yeah. it. it's, it's a labor of love, no doubt about it. So, well, John, I, I wish I could go all day just asking for these reminiscences, but hopefully it'll give people a, a taste of, of those years and, and what it was like to live in a time when you hadn't heard of C.S. Lewis or hadn't heard of this obscure pastor in New England with that sermon. And I think it also gives us a chance, John, to just say thank you. Uh, thank you for helping me create the world that I know that I've grown up in and grown up in my faith. And and um, you've played such a huge role in that. And um, I hope people will see that as well in, in the book on on Tim Keller. Thanks, John. Yeah, and I'm sure they will. I, thank you for writing it. And and that's the way I'm sure Tim and I feel is that we're standing on these guys' shoulders, right? Yeah. <laughs> Those little, <laughs> little crickets chirping away <laughs> and the swan has become silent. <laughs> Well, that's 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 what that's what I'm hoping people get not only from this interview but from the book is this sense of of there's a, almost a child childlike enthusiasm of being able to point to that. T I mean, when you're talking, John, about what seat you were sitting in when you read a certain book or 
which conference it was, somebody stood up and, and waved that book. I hope that, I mean, I know you've done that with so many of us, and Tim has as well. And um, those moments are, are life-changing. So if nothing else, people are inspired out there to give their lives to to reading and pondering great things and then putting them into action through faithful living, then we will accomplish something. It, you know, the, the note I would want to end on, Colin, yeah. is even though we've spent all of our time talking about the influence of men on right. men, I don't know where I'd be if Dan Fuller hadn't pushed my nose eight classes into the text and made me a Bible guy through and through. And the reason I say that is because Lewis went off the rails on three or four important issues, and I was not knocked off the rails. He's one of my heroes, and I think he's wonky on inerrancy. Right. And... (laughs) On His hell. understanding of the freedom of the will is right. not Calvinistic, and right. so is Edwards. I'm yeah. not a post-millennialist, and I think right. it's got some bad trajectories in it. And he baptized babies, and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't it amazing that yeah. we can have these these heroes and yet yeah. be be so different in some ways? And I attribute that to the fact, and this yeah. is what I would want pastors to be. Be Bible men, be right. Bible men, and then sort everything out from there. Well, that's um, so the kind of dominant perspective I got from the book actually came in a video that you and Tim had done with Don, and you were talking about your influences. And um, one of the things that Tim said is our influences are like rings on a tree, just keep expanding. And that helped me to understand Tim because the core was his conversion. And from there, it was immediately learning how to do inductive Bible study, essentially from Barbara Boyd at InterVarsity. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there, everything else makes sense as an outgrowth of that love for Christ that comes to conversion and a love for God's Word. It all starts there. You don't ever move on to something mm-hmm. else. You don't say, mm-hmm. that's great, but now I'm going to get into the good stuff with Edwards. Yeah. That was great. I'm going to get the good stuff with Lewis. It's always testing it by the Word. And like I said as well, it's also the rootedness of doing that week after week. I mean, when when Tim's, his first nine years, he's preaching 1,500 sermons, three sermons a week. Um, That does something, something good to a person. Um, And you really can't make up for that, no matter how many good books you would read. There's only one truly good book. That's good. Well, thanks, John. And it's always, 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 always fun time to talk with you. Thanks, Colin.